Hello folks, welcome back to our recorded lectures for HI 237. Uh, this is the Viking Duchy, Rollo and Normandy. Alright, so we've been looking forward to talking about this guy uh, for a while. Um, the only problem with Rollo is that we don't know as much as we'd like about him. And I know that's a problem that we have with a lot of these figures, but Rollo in particular is honestly such a pivotal character that I really wish that we had just a little bit more. But we're going to try and look at how Normandy gets going here, uh, because of course it then goes on to play such an enormous role in the later history of Western Europe. And that understanding where it came from is, I would say, essential. Okay, so what happens, unfortunately, is that our chronicle sources peter out at the very beginning of the 10th century. The next major source picks up in 919. That is 20 very critical years. And unfortunately, during those 20 years, we have this very significant figure. So this is Rollo, uh, who was given the lower valley of the Seine um, as his stronghold in 911. Uh, the king was his godfather. I'm not sure if I've mentioned the importance of spiritual kingship, kinship before. When you serve as somebody's godfather, you are effectively adopting them. They become part of your family. Now, he's definitely not the first Northman to be grant, granted land within Francia, but it was always a very individual sort of thing before this. Uh, you'd have grants of land to specific Vikings for recognition of individual service. There was never any sort of new political unit. But there is one prior Viking settlement that probably needs to be mentioned, and this is an enclave in the Nantes and uh, Loire River area. Um, this relates to the attack on Nantes in 843, which seems to have included a massacre of the people of the city. Um, by an unknown uh, process, however, the attackers settle in the county while well, the city remained, and I quote, deserted, devastated, and overgrown with briars and thorns. And this Viking enclave becomes well established by the early 10th century. Uh, do they become a part of local society? Hmm. Possibly. That's a considerable stretch of years uh, that they stay there. We simply don't have the sources. They don't endure, so it gets rid of them in the end. Uh, it's basically a revival of leadership in Brittany. Uh, Brittany, being coastal, had suffered greatly from Viking attacks, and uh, their duke, uh, Alan II, also known as Crooked Beard, returns from England uh, in 936, expels the Vikings from the Loire three years later, and that's the end of the enclave. Now there's uh, pushback in 944 from additional um, Northmen. We think they had come over from England. Uh, Alan holds on until he dies in 952, and Brittany spends 200 years as a very weak principality, although it always keeps its sort of weird uh, Celtic Frankish identity. Uh, why do I mention this? Well, Brittany becomes very important to the Normans a little later. Now, Rollo's deal was almost certainly meant to be temporary, uh, an individual measure like so many others before it, but why did it turn into something else? Well, simply because he and his successors were excellent military leaders, and the Frankish aristocrats were all kind of busy fighting each other. Now, who Rollo is, on the other hand, is a little bit unclear. Uh, Norman historians say he was a Dane. The sagas suggest he was Norse, and that he was a political exile who spent time in the Orkneys and Scotland before he moved on to Francia. Uh, he's said to have had a daughter, Kathleen, who's mentioned in Icelandic tradition. Uh, interesting, uh, his son, William Longsword, is said in later sources to have had a Christian mother from overseas. Now, Rollo is made Count of Rouen. Essentially, this involves him in a feudal relationship. A count um, is a military office, and he is required, in this case, to protect the lower valley of the Seine against other Vikings. So, is this new, or is this something that he'd already done before? Because if he had been carrying out these duties before he's made count, it makes him being made count make a lot more sense. I mean, we know he arrives um, around Rouen in the 9th century. He seems to have achieved the confidence of the Frankish population. He even married a Frankish woman, Popa, and uh, organized his army for defense. There is some suggestion that he actually had a pre-existing uh, relationship with the Archbishop of Rouen. 
a working relationship. So is the grant from Charles simply formalizing things? Now, Rouen was a key trading center. Uh, it had suffered a lot from previous Viking attacks, but it hadn't been abandoned because it had such an important economic role in the region. I mean, this pre-existing relationship, if it existed, may well have made him more Frankish in the idea in the eyes of the Franks. I mean, if he's taking on Carolingian practices in a sort of a governmental or administrative sense, he may have seemed like a very acceptable candidate for a position like this. Now, some historians suggest that Rollo, in fact, came over much later and that 9-11 uh, isn't an accurate date, but there's no evidence. Really, they just seem to advocate it to be contrary and cover all their bases. Uh, in any case, the treaty seems to have brought Rollo into the Frankish administrative structure. He was given all of the royal rights in the area except for the nomination of the bishop. Now, was he being given lordship over the Vikings in the area in order to settle them down? Or over the Franks in order to protect them from local Vikings? Um, hard to tell. I kind of lean towards the latter just because of what I just said about Rollo's apparent rights. <coughs> And certainly, um, Dudo believes that, and Dudo was the one uh, who wrote that excerpt that you read uh, on the arrival of the Northmen, and so he would have had access to sources that no longer exist, and we got to keep that in mind. Now, Rollo's rule over these lands is traditionally seen as the beginning of the uh, Duchy of Normandy, we can't really say that Normandy itself is a Viking duchy, at least not after the first several decades. But we have to remember that, you know, they had these origins. I mean, the elite in Normandy is Scandinavian, even if the bulk of the population is Frankish. There's no evidence of large-scale social or economic disruption. We have tax collection continuing, both royal and ecclesiastical. Uh, Archaeology is not so helpful in distinguishing between Frankish and Viking finds. Uh, historical sources, as I mentioned, are semi-helpful at best. There is one 918 document. It's an Acta of Charles granting the Abbey of Saint-Germain-de-Prés to Rollo and his associates, the Northmen on the Seine. Now, the major source for Normandy in the early period is Frankish chronicler, Flodoard of Rem. He writes a very brief set of annals, and he writes a set of annals that really um, are created for an audience who already pretty much knew what he was talking about. So his references are obscure. He doesn't even mention Rollo when he first mentions that the Northmen had been given provinces and the city of Rouen. He does mention him in 925. Uh, Rollo had been expansionist in a way that the Franks found unacceptable, and he was recorded as resisting Frankish retaliation that year. Uh, 927, he records the son of Rollo, uh, William Longsword, swearing his faith to Charles. Now, the other major source, Dudo of St. Quentin, is less reliable than Flodoard because he's so heavily influenced by hagiography and classical literature. Uh, the general agreement that his point was to try and make the Normans acceptable, to legitimize them, specifically to legitimize the 11th century claim of the Norman dukes to Brittany. He also depicts them as fundamentally independent from the French king by the time of Richard I. So he's biased, but again, he would have had access to the family sources. So we cannot write off what he has to say. Uh, we'll talk about um, the, that other piece from him that I gave you, Rollo obtains Normandy from the King of the Franks, uh, when we uh, are at the Zoom session. Okay, let's move on to William. So Rollo's new land doesn't, you know, spring into existence fully formed, whatever Dudo would like his readers to believe. The original grant is added to later. So um, on top of Rouen, he's given Bayou and Maine. Uh, in Brittany in 1933, at least technically. Um, we don't know how much territory in Brittany the Normans actually had control over. I mean, the frontier areas are full of claims and counterclaims, and without contemporary sources, we're in, we're in difficulty. Uh, Rollo, William, and other war leaders campaigned extensively in northern Francia, uh, with the purpose probably of winning more territory for themselves. 
Uh, William Longsword was not born in France. We know that much. Um, he likely would have been baptized and renamed alongside his father. Longsword may have been uh, sort of a nickname referring to his Scandinavian heritage or possibly something that he earned uh, while campaigning alongside his father. There is some suggestion that he perhaps came to power while his father was still alive. Uh, there's some hinting at some severe civil disruption in Normandy towards the end of Rollo's life, and Dudo claims that Rollo bestowed his uh, authority on his son, possibly because he was seen to have somehow failed by his men. Uh, we're told that the expansion to the east had been halted by conflict with Flanders and Vermandois, so is this why? Now, William does quite well, and by 927 he's in control of his own territory. Um, at this time, he may have been encouraged to look to the Vikings in uh, Brittany and to bring them under control. So we see a war start. Um, coins are issued in William's name, naming him as Duke of the Bretons. Uh, how real is this title? We're not sure. And uh, he is murdered in 942, assassinated, um, according to Dudo, martyred. Uh, really, it was part of a conflict uh, with the Count of Flanders, but it did happen at a peace conference, which made the Count of Flanders look really, really, really bad. All right. So the Franks tried to reconquer Normandy in the 940s after William's death. Uh, his successor, Richard, was quite young, Plus, he was the son of a Breton concubine of William's. Apparently, uh, Louis IV was plotting against him. But he was saved, we are told by Dudo, by new Scandinavian settlers. He may have been only nine years old at the time. Uh, his, um, his survival is most likely attributable to the success of his father in setting himself up as uh, Count of Rouen, not just... Uh, the princeps, or the war leader of the Northmen. So he had loyalty from both the Frankish and the North northern population. Uh, Louis IV um, was on the uh, march as uh, soon as William died, so Richard's claim was in serious doubt. But he was supported by the people of the city of Rouen, by the church, and by part of the Scandinavian nobility, including uh, Bernard the Dane, who had been his father's uh, chief captain. Now, that said, uh, other Scandinavians took pieces of Normandy for themselves. Uh, there was a herald that took part of uh, Brittany, for instance, and so they shrank the borders. Now, weirdly, when Louis got to Normandy, he actually recognized Richard uh, as his father's heir. But uh, some of the Northmen swore their allegiance to the king, um, while others swore to uh, Hugh the Great, Hugh Capet. Uh, so the question is, was Normandy partitioned? And the answer is they really, it really seems to have been partitioned, at least at this point. Uh, the following year, um, Louis and Hugh come back in and divide things between themselves. But then they start to disagree. Uh, Hugh withdraws. Richard's lands, his personal lands, are given to a local Frankish aristocrat. And Louis, uh, Louis takes Richard as a, uh, not a hostage per se, but you know, kind of takes him into tutelage at the royal court. Now, <laughs> here's where things get a little odd. Uh, Harold, the one who took over part of Brittany, uh, tries to take Rouen. They try to hold a peace conference in a 945, but it's botched, and Louis is seized by the Northmen. The king is then traded for Richard, who takes control of his inheritance at the age of 13. Uh, Harold kind of vanishes from the... Uh, from the historical record, he's maybe persuaded to either retire or go away. Uh, the Frankish government governor appointed by Louis was exiled to Paris. Now, when he's in control, uh, Richard immediately allies with Hugh the Great, and he is supportive of the new Capetian kings who take control in 987. He resisted the last Carolingian king, Lothar, uh, who was actually responsible for invading his lands. Um, he actually married into the Capetian family. He married Hugh Capet's sister, Emma, and he ruled until 996. 
you know, this is a colossally long reign. It's possibly the best possible thing that could have happened to Normandy at the time. You know, it's 51 years under the same ruler, so able to spend all that time consolidating the duchy. Uh, a lot has changed by the time Richard goes to his eternal reward. Uh, by the time he's done, his people were basically French-speaking instead of Scandinavian, and had been culturally assimilated to a significant degree. Uh, his lands, instead of being Neustrian, were now already being called Northmania or Normania. We don't see Normandy in written sources until the 11th century. And his son and grandson would then go on and build on his work. Now, Richard marries um, the Countess of Brittany and takes full control over her lands. He put his half-brothers in charge of counties, he married off aunts and cousins to important Norman families, built castles along the frontiers, and built monasteries in order to further his family's relationship with the church. Now, Robert, his son, pushes the borders further south, and he established Norman power much more securely. Um, he didn't quite achieve the eventual borders of the duchy, but he did secure his domain uh, for his son, uh, his son William, his illegitimate son William, who was called the Bastard at the time, but we know him as William the Conqueror, because he's the one that takes England. So the political history of Normandy prior to Robert's death is very patchy, it's full of holes, it's difficult to talk about in any sort of detail, but um, you see... Um, you know, he's largely building on what his father did. All right, shifting now to talk a little bit more about the government of Normandy. Now, the scholar Eleanor Cyril sort of redefines the argument about what Normandy was by arguing that it's not really controlled by Rollo and his successors, but by war bands that are simply you know, tied to Rollo and his family, and uh, you don't have a true territorial lordship until the 11th century. She says the, uh, the boundaries are in flux, and the Norman rulers had to sit down and subjugate a number of local lords and powers. Now, she argues that they didn't always do this militarily, that it could be done diplomatically. Um, there's an example she gives, uh, Nigel of the Cotentine, that's the actual peninsula that sticks out into the English Channel. And uh, it seems to have been a combination of patronage and threats that win him over to the Norman side. Uh, in other cases, they manage marriage alliances. And this is not at all different uh, than how any other medieval rulers conducted themselves. Now, she says that eventually magnates were brought into a proper sort of formal relationship with the Norman ruler couldn't simply be done by warrior charisma or by the sword. Um, by Richard the first time, she argues he's trying to convince his Scandinavian subjects to see him as a legitimate civil ruler. Now, the relationship with the king she defines as being kind of touchy, but that's not really all that different than the king's relationship with any other regional prince. Uh, Richard might just have been a little bit more of a Viking about it. <laughs> now, the silence on a lot of these issues, or the glossing over of these issues, constitutes a further problem with sources. I mean, the later Norman sources do not want to depict the dukes as struggling. So they do tend to suggest that the territory belonged to them from the outset. They don't want to talk about state building. So, you know, how Scandinavian was Normandy? It's a great debate still. I mean, how much continuity is there from the Carolingian period? Uh, in the 10th century, a writer at Soissons called Rouen a Danish city. Uh, we also notice changes in the local place names. A river um, very close to the city also has a Scandinavian name. Now, we can't really argue that uh, Normandy evolved towards a typical post-Carolingian territorial principality. I mean, the ruler's titles were Carolingian, the churches were re-established on Carolingian sites, the settlers wound up speaking French, or Frankish rather, by the early 11th century, and their culture was largely Christian. So however they got there, that is where they landed. Now, Rollo himself, was he a Christian? I mean, Dudo talks about him granting estates and restoring church buildings, um, mentions Robert of Neustria as his godfather, and that he had been baptized as Robert. There's even a little bit of support uh, for this, 
The records at Saint Denis in 968 record Richard I's grandfather as Robert, not Rollo. But uh, to be fair, um, might not have been a very convincing conversion. We know, for instance, that the Archbishop of Rem uh, in 914 sent a handbook on the conversion of errant pagans to the Bishop of Rouen. It's like, here, you need this. Uh, considerably later, um, Adamar Shaban, the writer, claims that Rollo offered uh, gifts to the churches, but also decapitated pagan prisoners as sacrifice to his previous gods. This is considerably later as a reference. Um, but even the person who wrote William's elegy claimed that William had been, quote, assailed by enemies while his heathen father was dying. So there are little bits and snippets that suggest that Rollo, you know, may have gotten his feet wet in Christianity, but was perhaps not a very good Christian. Now, in Longsword's reign, we have indications of developments in the uh, minting of coin. Uh, we see the construction of princely palaces and the increasing use of written documents. Um, he is assuming what you might call an ideology of Christian rulership. And this is highly influenced by Carolingian models. Uh, his elegy, when he dies, calls him a peacemaker, a protector of the poor, widows, and orphans. Now, that being said, we continue to see fresh Scandinavian arrivals into the settlement. They continue to have close contact with Scandinavian colonies elsewhere, well into the 11th century. They also have, uh, you know, culturally Scandinavian features. Um, there's folk memories, you might say. Uh, the place names in a lot of Normandy show a distinct Scandinavian influence, as do personal names preserved in place names. Uh, there's a great quote from one historian that Scandinavians were new masters building on old foundations. Now, there is definitely a perception of a difference between Normans and Franks in the 10th century. Uh, a contemporary reference to the death of one of the Norman dukes calls him the Duke of the Pirates. But uh, by the time of Richard II, Normandy is a very powerful principality. Um, there are a few examples of... Uh, it being a threat to the region's stability anymore, because it's just it's part of the region. It has established itself as being important. It essentially became respectable. But there was also a tradition of independence, despite the feudal relationship. There are very few examples of a Norman duke doing homage to the French king. Uh, yes, we have sucky sources, but yeah, that's really interesting. And some argue that the homage that was given, in some cases, what we, what we call homage de pays which is uh, a treaty, it's not submission. So are Rollo and his successors fideles rather than vassals? It's ambiguous because feudal society is not so neatly defined. Um, it's situational. And without better sources, we can't be sure. And fideles are like you know, trusted allies rather than people who are actually subordinate to you. I mean, when you throw cultural differences and in politics into the mix, who's to say that it's one thing and not the other? Um, the Dukes of Normandy, even prior to becoming kings of England, had an oddly sort of sovereign position within their own duchy. They're referred to as if they're a king in certain ceremonies that we have records of. They're not called king, but they're treated as if they were. And Richard I, in 1015, seems to have claimed according to Dudo, that he held his duchy from God alone, not the king. So as you can see, there are a lot of mixed signals here, and it makes Normandy absolutely fascinating. I'm really hoping that someday someone finds a hitherto unknown set of annals in a box in somebody's attic in France. It would just be so wonderful to know more. Anyways, that is it for the Viking Duchy. I will look forward to seeing you guys at the Zoom session on Tuesday. Uh, have a great rest of the weekend.